So hello everyone and welcome to this, the second webinar in our Good Dissemination Practices uh, series. And this webinar is on good ownership practices. And my, my name is Sean Lacey. I'm the university's research integrity and compliance officer. Um, last week, we had a very uh, informative session led by Sinead Hanner and our digital scholarship librarian on predatory journals and identifying them. This week, we're looking at ownership. And I suppose how I'm going to try to maybe approach this uh, webinar is different to previous ones that I facilitated, whereby I'm going to look for maybe a small bit of engagement by introducing maybe a dilemma, kind of a fictitious dilemma that uh, could uh, that would be related to authorship to see maybe how you'd actually handle that dilemma. So I'm going to look at just doing some anonymous polling, and then I'll move into kind of some, I suppose, material that we have in the university that maybe would actually help us maybe address that dilemma. So that's the kind of the the flow we're going to have to this one. Uh, at any point, if you have any questions, I don't mind if you want to unmute and just ask the question. There's no issues like that. Equally, pop them into the chat, and I'm sure we'll try to have time at the end uh, to answer any questions as well. Okay, so there's no issues like that. So I suppose first, maybe just to kind of say, look, why are we maybe even doing this? And look, how does this fit into uh, research integrity? Well, if, if we look at our research integrity policy, which was approved by the Research Council and the Academic Council in May 23, uh, we have four principles, four main principles around research integrity. Now, but there can be others, I suppose, but essentially our four main principles that we look at in the university is around the accountability, honesty, reliability, and respect. And I suppose when you think of the idea of disseminating your work and attributions and authorship and so on, it is important that you're accountable for all the work that you, you're going to author or you're saying that you're author. And you're, uh, it's important to be honest with that. It's important that when someone is looking at that research record, that it's reliable and that there's generally respect for other authors or other contributors to the research that actually is being, uh, I suppose, disseminated or published all depending. OK, so you can see how research integrity and the principles would very much align with what we have with authorship. And then also maybe just to flag, I suppose, we have unacceptable research practices and these are called out in our research integrity policy. And these unacceptable research practices are uh, the ones I'm looking at here are related to publications, so that you could have publication related misconduct, which would be claiming undeserved authorship, denying authorship to contributors, artificially proliferating authorship uh, publications, and failure to correct the publication work. And these are things that we're going to be touching on in, in this webinar as well. And I suppose what I'd always feel that is very important for us within the university is more often than not, we are... I suppose we're not looking at reinventing the wheel here that this, when we look at research integrity, the principles of research integrity that we have within the university, they are aligned with what is uh, done nationally and very much led by the National Research Integrity Forum. It aligned with the OECD report. There's going to be links uh, to this uh, in the chat. And if you're actually watching this as a recording, they're in the description below, you'll see links to various documents that will kind of show how our research integrity policy aligns with national and international practices. And the last one there just to pop up is the all European uh, academies. This will be the European Code of Conduct for Research Integrity, which is often mentioned uh, in fora relating to research integrity. And it's a very nice document. And all those are actually quite nice, easy reads. They're not a big intensive uh, reads that you have, but essentially what you'd find is how our policy is aligning with all this, okay? Now, before, going into, I suppose, our policy. And there's also going to be another policy we'll touch on in another uh, minute or two, which will be authorship, authorship, an authorship policy that we have. I just want to pose a dilemma to you. And I'd like to kind of see, look, how would you handle this type of dilemma? Okay, and this is fictitious. Okay, this is actually comes from the dilemma game. And there's going to be, I have a slide at the very end, which will show, uh, give a link. And I think there's going to be a link in the chat and in the description below with the dilemma game, which is quite a useful, I suppose, app essentially around how you know, to maybe teach or train uh, good research practices, uh, basically, and how research could be uh, carried out aligning with research integrity. So uh, a bit of text here, obviously, so this, I will read it through, and I'd be interested then in your, your take on this and how I get your, uh, ho hopefully get your take is through some anonymous polling, okay? And it's important to say that it is anonymous, so I won't know how people are actually answering, okay? So you've just finished an article to submit to a journal. You've done the research with input from several other researchers, but it was you who did most of the work. They gave their input to the theoretical framework, but you collected the data, analyzed the data, and wrote the article. You feel it is fair they are listed as co-authors. However, your former supervisor, who is a very influential scholar in the field, has asked you to list him as first author, even though he did the least work. You would like to maintain a good relationship because he has 
Uh, he has been really helpful. He, sorry, because he has really, sorry, I was reading it wrong, because he has really helped you in the past and can offer you opportunities in the future. What do you do? Okay. So let's look at these uh, scenarios here. And as, how I'd always look at it when I do this uh, dilemma game is there's going to be four scenarios put up here as in what do you do. It's not that it has to be one of these. There could be maybe a fifth scenario or sixth scenario or fifth outcome or sixth outcome. But essentially what I find in kind of an environment like this or maybe in, a, in an actual face-to-face -face environment, this can really encourage kind of discussion around the uh, dilemmas and it can actually encourage that kind of reflection and uh, reflective piece as well. But anyway, but obviously we have a limited time, so we just get straight into it. So you tell him he can be second order on your paper. You agree to list him as first order. So he's asking to be first order. So this is where, how do you handle this, okay? Uh, so you agree to list him as first order. You agree to list him as first order, but list him as second when you submit the paper. He would probably not remember it anyway, since he publishes so many articles. You tell him he should really contribute to a publication if he wants to be an author or option E. Now, option E is maybe you'd feel that you wouldn't do any of those. Maybe you'd feel that there's something else there. Um, and that's absolutely fine. Again, these are not exhaustive. It's kind of to encourage that kind of reflective uh, reflection and, uh, and, dis and discussion. Okay. So essentially, I'll try to summarize it again. But I would always think that the, for me, I know it takes me a couple of reads to kind of first to see, look, what's really happening here. But essentially, you've just finished uh, an article that you're ready to submit. There's been colleagues that have contributed to this theoretical framework, and you're going to put them down as co-authors. You have a former supervisor who's quite influential, and he's asking you to put him down as first order. And you are feeling that you should because he could have a, an impact on your future. Okay. Option A, put him down as second order. Option B, put him down as first order. Option C, tell him you put him as first, but do it as second, he'll never know. Or option D, you tell him he should put, really contribute to a publication if he wants to be an author. And I think like what's interesting with this type of dilemma is how you would respond it can vary depending on where you are in your own research career. Um, but I think it's tried to be as honest as possible. Like, how do you think you would actually respond to something like this? So I'm just going to launch a poll here, and I'd be interested in your take if, when you, if you have a moment on this. So you should be able to see, actually not yet, you should now be able to see dilemma one up on your screen. And this is completely anonymous, so I don't know how anyone is going to be actually answering this. But what I'd be just interested to see is, look, how many, what, what do you, how would you think you would uh, approach this? And so looking at this here is we have, we've probably around 10 people in the room at the moment. Yeah, we've 10 actually here. So uh, we've seven responses. So it'd be great. I mean, look, I won't obviously leave this open too long, you know, but I mean, if there's those remaining three people in the room, if you could answer, that's fine. But equally, if you're not comfortable doing any answer and you want to just actually sit back and actually listen, that's absolutely fine now as well. And I'll, I'll share this just so, I mean, for absolute transparency, I'll share this so you can just see where everyone go, what everyone's take is on this. And then I'm going to kind of speak to our authorship policy and how maybe our authorship policy that we have in the university could maybe help us if we were in this type of scenario. And it's very important to kind of say that this is fictitious. This actually came from the dilemma game. This is not anything in relation to MTU at all. Okay, so look, we have nine responses there so far. So I'm just going to end the poll there and I will share the results just so everyone can actually see them there. So. I just actually want to take them down actually as well because just to re refer to them later on if need be okay brilliant thanks very much everyone let's go let's go to see what would our authorship policy say in a scenario like this okay so firstly so if you look at our authorship policy what our authorship policy does and i've tried to copy and paste the text here so there's a couple of this is text heavy to a certain extent but this is taken from authorship policies purposely so you can just see, look, that I'm not putting this into my own words or anything like that. But what our authorship policy says is in order to be named as an author of a research output, an individual must have met all the following four criteria. They must have, they must have, sorry, yeah, there we go. Sorry, the things stopped working. Substantial contributions. So that is to the conception or the design of the work or the acquisition or the acquisition analysis or the interpretation of the data. For the work okay so there's a couple of ors there it's not necessary to be involved in all those aspects but there's a couple of aspects to make a substantial contribution to and so that's what's important here it's and involved in the drafting of the work or revising it critically for important intellectual content content and final approval of the version to be disseminated and 
agreement to be accountable for all aspects of the work, ensuring that questions related to the accuracy or the integrity of any of the work are appropriately investigated and resolved. So it can't be a case of, look, oh, I'm not, I'm not do looking at doing the data analysis. I, I trust that other person to do it. That's fine. Whatever it says goes. There's, there can't be that. Okay, you have to be able to stand over all aspects of the research. Okay, and essentially, if a core in co-authored outputs, each author must have met all of these four criteria in order to be named as an author or co-author. And this is what's called out in our authorship policy. And I, I'm going to put up a, a link here now in a second, but uh, in relation to, I suppose. We are again not reinventing the wheel here. This is aligned with what's good practice both nationally and internationally. Also, it's important to kind of highlight it again. This is an authorship policy that I suppose involvements that do not merit authorship on their own. Now, if you're if somebody, if a researcher is filling one of these roles along with all four on the previous, then absolutely fine. But if it's just one of these and maybe one of the ones on the previous slide, that does not merit merit authorship on its own. So somebody that maybe is the pr principal investigator or supervisor of the research. That does not merit co authorship on its own. Somebody that maybe brought in the money. Now, obviously, bringing in the money, the grant holder, that's a very, very important part of research. We need that. But if somebody just brought it, brought in the money, I say just, but I mean, that's obviously a very big part of research. But if somebody brought in the research, uh, the money, then that is not merit for authorship on its own. To be in a leadership position where the research was conducted, to be the data collector or simply providing the data in the research output, to be a reviewer of the draft research output. So none of those in the, by themselves would warrant co-authorship. Now, each one of those are important and they would, they would be where you'd have contributions, but wouldn't be enough for authorship. And I'm gonna talk about contributions now in a couple of minutes as well. But this is, again, it's just to be awareness to what our authorship policy says, uh, our authorship policy being aligned with what's uh, done internationally in the, in, the, in the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, and also along with COPE, which is the Committee on Publication Ethics. So we are, again, not reinventing the wheel here. This is what's recognized nationally and internationally, okay? And the last thing then, I, then I want to return back to the actual dilemma that we have here is, when we look at this, is there's also, our ownership policy calls out unacceptable research practices in, in the actual policy itself, okay? And these are around honorary option. So this is naming individuals as authors from a sense of obligation because they hold senior positions and may have helped secure funding or supervise the work. That is an unacceptable research practice. Guest authorship, which, which where is you're naming individuals as authors because of their respect or influence in the hope that this will increase the likelihood of dissemination or the impact of the research output once shared. And so you can see I'm obviously uh, in mid flow of text here. So I'm reading is directly from the authorship policy that we have in relation to these unacceptable research practices. Gift authorship is another unacceptable research practice, which is where you're offering authorship to individuals in the hope that they will return the favor. And the last one, and this is not an exhaustive list, but this is these are the four that are called out in our authorship policy, is ghost authorship. And this is ghost authorship is not naming or acknowledging an author or contributor to conceal an influence that diminishes the objectivity of the content, for example, concealing an industry backing for the research. So where there could be a potential conflict of interest and not actually calling that out. Okay, so that there that would be seen as both authorship. And again, you can see that I'm, I'm actually reading from a text here is to kind of get those descriptions right. But those descriptions that I'm using are actually coming from our ownership policy. Okay. Um, from that then, what I want to do is I just want to return back to the dilemma. And maybe uh, there's, maybe actually what I'll do here, is I think we still have a good few, maybe what I'm going to just quickly do there maybe is I just relaunch that poll just to see, is there a quick change, is, is there any change in opinion here? And look, we'll do this quite fast. So I'm going to relaunch the poll here. Um, perfect. So you should be able to see the, the poll there for Dilemma 1 again. I'd just be curious to what options you might go with here. So we had nine responses previous. So two said A, three said D, and four said E. Okay, so it's great to see the couple of responses coming there. I have seven of 10 there at the moment. Okay, so where it's going, I, I'll stop it there now because obviously I want to progress as well. So yeah, right, I've eight there. So we go with that at the moment. Okay, so we've eight. 
end. I'm going to share the results there. And what we're seeing here is out of the eight that responded here is five are going with D and three are going with E. Okay. And I, oh, I'm more than happy if anyone wants to maybe pop into uh, the chat to why they may have gone with E. If they want to, I, I, I can read it out without calling out the name. Uh, equally, if somebody wants is comfortable or muting, maybe giving a reason to what option E would be more than happy to discuss that if you so wish. Just looking over here at the chat just to see. If anyone wants to look, if you want, you can maybe be thinking away why what option E would be, and we might look at that at the end. Equally, now you might be just happy to say, look, you're going on option E and just leave it at that, which is absolutely fine. Okay, so we stop sharing there with that one. And I'm going to, I want to, uh, I suppose, just kind of delve into this dilemma a very small bit, okay? Because I think the focus of this dilemma, and again, this came from the dilemma game, uh, which is an app, very much focuses on the supervisor. But I want to maybe just look about look at those colleagues that inputted to the theoretical framework. So we had colleagues that get their input into the theoretical framework, and you feel it is fair they are listed as co-authors. Now, if somebody gave the input into the theoretical framework and just stopped at that, if we look at our authorship policy, that does not merit authorship. Like our authorship policy, so AP authorship policy, states that substantial contributions to the conception, drafting the work, or revising it critically. So even though that the focus of this dilemma and even what do you do, it was very much directed towards the supervisor. When you look at this one here, it actually there is actually you or me or whoever the researcher is here is actually at fault a small bit as well because I, I use the tense that is used there. Okay, so you are you stating these people as co-authors, but their actually input was not substantial enough if you're looking at the authorship policy, which is in line with the ICMJE and COPE as well. Also. And I didn't put up text on this, but the European Code of Conduct and the National Research Integrity Forum call out that authorship itself is based on a significant contribution to the design of the research, relevant data collection, or the analysis or the interpretation of the results. And somebody that gave their input there, an input to the theoretical framework, does not actually cover that. So as the lead, as the researcher here, you're actually at fault putting them as a as quarters. Contributions, absolutely. Acknowledged as a contribution, absolutely. Co-ordership, not going by our ownership policy. If we go also then look at the first order aspect, so the supervisor who wanted to come in as first order, well, he's helped you in the past and can offer you opportunities in the future. So obviously, instead of me there, it should be you, can offer you opportunities in the future. But again, if we look at our ownership policy, it says leadership position where the research was conducted is not merit for ownership on its own. So somebody using their that leadership position is not an, enough. Equally, the European Code of Conduct and the National Research Integrity Forums document says manipulating authorship, misusing seniority to encourage violations of research integrity are forms of unacceptable research practices. So I suppose what I'm just trying to show here with the guidelines is our authorship policy is calling it out as unacceptable, but equally nationally and internationally it's been called out as unacceptable as well. Okay, and if we go return back to the dilemma, my own personal take on this is if I had to go with these four options and not going into an option E is I would tell that super that person that my previous supervisor that he really needs to contribute to a publication if he wants to be a co-author. But then comes the thing about, well, what's contribution? Okay, and obviously we touch on contribution a small bit in the authorship policy itself. And I mentioned that as those kind of four criteria, but equally there's this, it's, there's a bit more delving in that we could look at that. Okay, and I want to come back to that one. All right. So I want to come to speak to the idea of uh, uh, contribution as well. But just first, and I just have two slides here about just calling out other thing, uh, other points in terms of national and international practices. So nationally and internationally, I suppose the two main documents that I'm using here is the National Research Integrity Forum's National Policy and Ensuring Research Integrity in Ireland, which the university supports. And equally, the European Code of Conduct for Research Integrity, which has a revised version from June 23. The previous version was 2017. And um, again, the university does support this as well. OK, so just a couple of points here. And I just popped the four up on the screen here. And I, I, I just spoke, I mean, obviously, a bit texty. The, the slide deck will be shared afterwards, so you can actually have it as a point of reference. But just maybe just to kind of focus on the bold parts here is that if you're to be named as author or co-author, you're fully responsible for the content of the publication. You, I think what is encouraged is that among the orders that you, you agree a sequence to the ownership. Now that can be tricky. That can be a tricky conversation that you have. And this is where I'm going to touch on contributions later on. And that might help with that actual conversation that you have. But often what, what is encouraged here is that a conversation around ownership should happen at the early stages. We shouldn't be waiting to our research 
uh, journey is near complete and we're looking at the idea of publishing, we should look at it because if you think of research, research is uh, producing new knowledge. That's essentially what it is, okay? And, and that's part of our definition that we have of research within the university. So if you're producing new knowledge or generating new knowledge, it's only right then that you want to share it. So then if you want to share it, then who are you going to acknowledge as part of that, that contributed to the generation of that new knowledge? So you're going to look at disseminating, you're going to look at uh, uh, public, uh, publishing, which then means authors are involved. So it's not going to be a big surprise if you're involved in a research study that you're going to be looking at disseminating later on. So it shouldn't be a shock at the very start of the research journey that you kind of say, well, what's our plan here for authorship later on? Or do we have a publication plan? Like that, that's that's really what can help get the conversation going. And it's not that you're getting ahead of yourself there. Again, if you're doing research, it's to generate new knowledge. When you generate new knowledge, you want to share it. So that's where authorship is. Okay, so it's it's important to be aware of that. Okay. It's also important that if we do generate this new information, and we it is important that it is shared in a timely manner. It shouldn't be actually put away in a cupboard or however we store things now for a year or two and then look to actually disseminate it because it actually might be dated. Okay. It is important that to acknowledge important work intellectual contributions. So there's two aspects here. There's the authorship and then there's contributions. And I'll come back to that as well. There, it's a very important to disclose any conflict of interest. Okay, now this, having a conflict of interest does not mean that somebody cannot be an author. It, that varies depending on look what the actual conflict of interest is. But it's very important to disclose any conflict of interest, even if maybe it's a perceived conflict of interest. It's important to call that out. And you can see sometimes when you're publishing with certain journals, they actually ask you as part of the submission process, uh, report any conflict of interest. Okay, so that actually is part of good research practice as well. Um, it is natural. We don't necessarily like it happening, but we do make mistakes. We could come across an error in our results that maybe have been published, and it is important that we correct the research record. So if we publish work, and then as subsequently, we notice that there's an error in our work, which has an impact on our uh, findings, we should look to be correcting that. And that could mean reaching out to the journal to look at if maybe addressing the error. It all depends on how big the error is. The error could be something that's very a small typo, and it can be fixed up. The error could be quite big that actually it might have had a knock-on effect on the results and maybe the paper needs to be retracted. But that's important because if there's an error, essentially that error can build because when you publish your work, the future researcher is going to look at building on your work. So if there's an error in your work, well, then that has an impact on the future researcher as well, okay, and the future research output. So it's important and it's a key component of good research practice that if you notice that there's a correction or an error, you call that out and you follow up on it. It is important to actually uh, share negative results. It can't be just, oh, I'm going to share the results that might support my hypothesis or support my objectives. If something is maybe in conflict with whatever your hypothesis or your study objectives, it's important to report them as well. And previous journals were kind of more interested in, you'll say, statistically significant results or results that were positive. There is more of an awareness around that it's actually quite important to be reporting the negative results as well. Now, negative is a very broad term to what it actually means. That can vary depending on the research context as well. Okay. And the last thing, I suppose, is just to be aware of this, I suppose, these examples of good orders of practice that I'm outlining here, uh, and I suppose the criteria in the previous slide, that's irrespective of where you are actually looking at disseminating or publishing your work. Like it doesn't matter whether it's an open access journal that you're looking at or a, subs a subscription journal that you're going to go for. These are all still applicable. Okay, so it doesn't necessarily matter. It's essentially uh, to what journal you're going for. It is essentially you're looking at uh, or, uh, disseminating or publishing your work. Authorship is a key component of that. Okay, so moving on then, I want us to look at a second dilemma. OK, so and this is this is just to break it up a small bit as opposed to you maybe listening to me the whole time, kind of referencing or preaching or not necessarily preaching, but just continuously referencing our policies. But I suppose I'd be a big advocate that when we have these policies, they have to be of use to us. And like where I would feel our ownership and our research integrity policies are of use to us is if we're in these dilemmas and how the policies actually can be a help here. OK, so I've another dilemma here. You will notice there on this uh, the slide here, there is a logo for Sirrit. Sinead Hanrahan, our Digital Scholarship Librarian, and myself are members of this um, national consortium called uh, CIRIT, which is Cross-Institutional Research Integrity Training. The reason I put that logo up there is not necessarily to promote it, even though it obviously is, but it, this dilemma is something that we did created within that CIRIT group. So it's important, I would feel, that when I'm using something that was created in CIRIT, that I acknowledge CIRIT. So that's why that logo is up there. Okay. So here's our second dilemma. 
You're a new staff member at a university. You have been working on a research project that requires the use of samples given to you by another colleague. In addition, the technician has given you support with setting your equipment correctly. In both cases, this work was done with the understanding that both your colleagues will be named as authors on any publication that result from this research. So that's what you said to them, okay? You said to your colleagues that you will put them down as authors on any publication from the, this, the research. So you add your colleagues as authors when you submit your work to a peer review journal. However, the editor of the journal has contacted you about the authorship statement. I'll speak more about an authorship statement later on, uh, but at the moment we'll take it as basically where you've outlined who's contributed to what, okay, in the research. So that's essentially what it is, but I'll give an example of it in a few minutes. So the authorship statement, so you submitted with the paper. So the, I'll read that sentence again, because obviously I stopped mid-sentence. The editor of the journal has contacted you about the authorship statement you submitted with the paper. What you have outlined as work completed by your colleagues does not merit the authorship criteria for the journal. And you do encounter that. Some journals have authorship criteria. So in this case, what, what if I say you, so what you have outlined as the contributions of your other, your colleagues does not meet the criteria for this journal, as the authorship criteria for this journal. So what do you do? Now, there's, there's a bit of text here for this one, so that's why I've broken up into two slides here. But essentially, if I was looking at kind of summarizing that as best as possible, you've, you're a new member of the university, you've carried out research with uh, your new colleagues. Um, one colleague has kind of helped you with the samples, the other colleague was the technician, you acknowledge you were saying, look, that if they help you out, you're going to give them ownership on a publication. That's essentially that's the first paragraph. The second paragraph then is where you submit your work uh, to a peer review journal. You mention the two colleagues that are as quarters. You put in the con authorship statement, and the journal uh, journal editor picks up on it to say, look, what you've said your colleagues have done doesn't meet the criteria for the authorship authorship criteria for the journal. What do you do? Okay, so change there for me. So what do you do? A bit texty here, okay, but I suppose it's trying to kind of make it as real as possible, okay? So you explain the situation to your colleagues and say that you have no choice but to remove their names from the paper. They are not happy and imply that they will report you to the Research Integrity and Compliance Officer, okay? You withdraw your paper from the journal. Now, I'm just going to say, it's not, some of these answers could be, you know, actually, it's a cheap process out loud, just all to you, you'd never do that. And that's absolutely fine, like, that's what it's there for. And again, if we were in this kind of face-to-face -face or classroom environment, this is where we would have that, that kind of discussion as well, okay? So what we do, sorry, so B here, you withdraw the paper from the journal and submit to another journal that does not have a strict and authorship criteria. C, you tell the editor that it was an error and that you accidentally submitted an earlier version of the authorship statement. You then submit a new authorship statement with fabricated information in order to meet the journal's guidelines. You don't think it makes any real difference. D, you decide not to publish this work as it is too difficult to make a decision that pleases everybody. You do not want to upset colleagues, especially as you're a new member, new staff member at the university. Okay, so what do you think of this one? So let me launch that poll there. Okay, so you should see dilemma two up on your screen there. Um, if you're interested, again, anonymous here, what do you want to do here with this one? What, what do you think here? And maybe the answer is very obvious, okay? Now, I, I will only call you once in this one, okay? I know I did it twice in the last one, but I will only call you once in this one, okay? So it'd be interesting your take. Again, there seems to be 10 people in the room. We nine, eight and nine responses to the last to dilemma one when it was called twice. Be interesting your take here. And again, I will share it. So there's absolute transparency to what people are saying. We have five answers so far. Okay, so seven responses there. And I know, look, I mean, you might say you feel under pressure answering this and you'd need more time. Um, that's completely understandable, okay? So look, that's where this recording can be something, uh, this video is obviously, this webinar is recorded and you can go back and maybe think more. You can have the dilemma, have the context up on your uh, screen and kind of think more about it and you can see, okay? But anyway, we have seven responses here, okay? So I'll end the poll there. And I'll share just so you can all see. So what we're saying here is five are saying A, one is saying B, and one person is saying E. And obviously we are, we're looking at a small enough group here, but it's, it is just interesting to see five are saying A, B and C, B and E are um in uh there's one person each. Now if somebody that's maybe put in B E, 
want to maybe share or equally know if anyone wants to share why they're picking a particular scenario, that's absolutely fine as well. I mean, if you want to share anything like that. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to kind of work through these and just kind of see, look, how does this link back to maybe things that we've covered already in the previous slides, okay? So I, so what do, what do you do? You explain the situation to your colleagues and say that you have no choice but to remove their names from the paper. Now, I would think, so, so let me read it out. They're not happy and imply that they will report you to the Research Integrity and Compliance Officer. Now, really, that as the Research Integrity and Compliance Officer, that last sentence is actually irrelevant, really, okay? Because essentially what you nearly have here is you have a colleague that is looking to follow good practice. Uh, so now, obviously, these other colleagues maybe feel that, that this is not good practice, and maybe that's why they're saying the report to the Research Integrity and Compliance Officer but essentially that last point wouldn't necessarily be applicable looking at the, at the information that we have here, taking it at face value. I suppose the one thing that I would like maybe probably add to A, like I would think I personally pick A, I think if I remembered each one of these, uh, I might revisit. I think it's A is my answer as well to this one, but um, it's that you wouldn't put them down as authors, but again, you would acknowledge them as a contribution. And I think that, that that's just not what's called out there. And maybe that's what held off somebody answering and putting the E. Not you. I would look at that they're not authors, but they are. Uh, they did help. They did offer guidance or give give input input that you would uh, put it down as a contribution. Withdraw the paper from the journal and submit to another journal that does not have a strict and authorship uh, criteria. That wouldn't be good practice because essentially you are wrong in naming these two these two colleagues as authors, given the contribution. Again, going by the, the blurb that we have in the previous slide. So you ignoring this uh, editor and going off to another journal, you're actually now being negligent here and you're actually then not in compliance with our authorship policy in this case. Tell the editor that it was an error. Obviously this one always, re uh, well, it's, this is the worst of them. Uh, tell the editor that it was an error and that you accidentally submitted an earlier version of the authorship statement. You then submit a new authorship statement with fabricated information in order to meet the journal's guidelines. You don't think it, it makes any real difference. So it does make difference because essentially the key word in there that if it was to jump out of me is fabricate. And fabricate is one of the one of our three uh, most serious types of research misconduct. So research, uh, ownership policy and nationally, internationally calls out the falsification, fabrication and plagiarism are our three most serious types of research misconduct. And here you're fabricating. It's called out. OK, so this clearly is an unacceptable research practice. And it could actually be seen as severe as a research misconduct case here. It, it depends on more, you need more information, but essentially fabrication is not encouraged. It's it's completely in non-compliance with our research integrity policy. You decide not to publish this work as it is too difficult to make a decision that pleases everybody. You do not want to upset colleagues, especially as you're a new staff member. It's this is the one that you nearly empathize most with, you know, that you want to kind of keep everyone happy. So the easiest thing is to nearly walk away and not do anything. But I suppose if you go back to one of the points that was mentioned in the good ownership uh, Good ownership practices that it's important to disseminate your work in a timely manner, not not ignore it. So this here will be where you're not nearly aligned with good ownership practice in itself. Okay, so if I was going with any there, my own take would be if I'm going with A to D, a uh, discussion obviously would be around E. I would be going with A myself for that one. Okay, now what we've touched on a bit, and this is kind of the last kind of I suppose uh, let's say texty bits that I'm going to talk about here. Uh, and maybe we'll have, have time maybe for questions then if there are uh, questions is around contribution. Okay, so contribution has been mentioned a lot. Uh, I, think, I think nearly throughout this whole session, contribution has been mentioned. Again, contribution is actually covered uh, covered quite well in our ownership policy. And again, I, this is where I feel our ownership policy is there to help us, okay? Because it can help us handle these various dilemmas. So first one is, it is strongly advised that research collaborators discuss ownership at an early stage. So I touched on that already. Like it's, it shouldn't be a shock that we want to disseminate, we want to publish. So it can't be seen as, oh, you're getting ahead of yourself if you want to talk about ownership at an early stage. It's good to have these conversations at an early stage because you know where you stand. Then what you would do in that case is you would just, so you discuss ownership, and this is at the early stage, and you'd note the decisions. Look, this is what we kind of said. This is our kind of plan for when it comes to ownership of the, the, the research outputs. Now, maybe you would have multiple research outputs and you might have ownership for different ones. And it's worth putting in the effort to actually have, look, what is our plan here for this? Now, it doesn't mean that when you, you set this plan that it's something fixed that can change. It completely can change. There could be somebody down, a part of the research team was that was going to lead out on a particular output and who would have been potentially first order. 
but then due to whatever reasons couldn't lead out of it. So there's then so maybe now maybe would be reduced to third or fourth order, or maybe would be reduced to a contribution. And that's absolutely fine, but these these are things that would have to be documented. Okay. Um the university recommends credit. Okay, and I'm going to touch on credit now, really, and it's, I, I think it's something that's quite helpful. And what credit does, so credit is a contributor's role to taxonomy, and we're going to touch on this now in the next couple of slides, I think two slides time. And what it does is it clarifies contributions. So this is kind of internationally recognized to what contributions would be for an actual research study. Okay, and what credit does is it offers authors and contributors the opportunity to share and act is to share an accurate and detailed description of their contributions, okay? And it is helpful for everyone then to actually to nearly have a discussion around credit. And this is called out in our ownership policy. So just to touch on the credit, so there's 14 parts of this taxonomy. So I'm just going to mention each one here. Then the next two slides afterwards are kind of give more description. So I'll skip over those two slides, but they can be a point of reference for yourselves then as well, okay? So... For credit, and I, I kind of quickly go through these, but it's essentially, you, you want to kind of know, well, who came up with the idea? Like whose concept was this research? Who curated the data? So who brought in the data maybe? Who managed the data? Who cleaned the data? Who prepped the data for the form and analysis? Who then carries out the form and analysis? Now who, maybe there might be multiple who's there, okay? But who does that form and analysis? Who brought in the money? Very big comp component of research is somebody that's bringing in the money. Who's actually carrying out the investigation? Who's formally going out there maybe and getting the data in, you know, maybe carrying out the focus groups, carrying going in, actually in the lab, rolling up their sleeves and doing the stuff in the lab, whatever the research context is. But who's doing that? What methodology has been used and who actually helped with setting up that methodology? Who put together that plan? What the plan then could be a publication plan, data management plan, statistical analysis plan. That all kind of feeds into kind of this methodology. Who's managing the project? What resources are required? I mean, did somebody have to bring in these resources? Maybe a particular software was required for a particular research that we needed, we were doing. And so then that obviously speaks to the software as well. Okay, so that, some of these are, they're not necessarily, mute, they're not mutually exclusive, they can overlap. Who's supervising the research? Maybe nobody is, but I mean, that is part of credit. Who's validating the research outputs? Who's visualizing the data? Who's going to write the first draft? Maybe it's multiple people that write the first draft. Who's going to review it before it? Uh, if you review and do the final edits. So this is credit. This is something that's called out in our ownership policy as being encouraged that our researchers would look at. Now, how how does how do we do this? And there's loads of ways that we actually could do this. Now, my next two slides are basically the text around those 14 tax uh, aspects here. So I'm not I'm not going through them here. But I just wanted to put up maybe a sample contribution table because I suppose in my mind is very good. I think it's quite useful to know look well what is good practice. But sometimes it's, I would think it's even more useful than to, well, how do I implement that good practice? So I know credit is good, but how do I do it? Okay, how would I use it? And this is just kind of giving an example of how you could do it. So this is just saying, maybe we're carrying out a research study and there's five contrib contributors. And what you do here is you map, you look at your, four, your taxonomy and you kind of say, look for each contributor, who has done what? And you start doing tick boxes, that's all, okay? Now, you could equally say, like if I look at conceptualization here, there's a tick for contributor one, two, three, four, okay? But maybe one did more than two, two did less than three, three did more than four, whatever way we want to work on that. It's a bit kind of confusing how I said it there, but I suppose essentially the ticks nearly, nearly imply that everyone's equal there for contributor one to contributor four, but maybe the contribute, contribution, contribution to, kind of, to the conceptualization varies. So sometimes what I would, I would have seen here is somebody would use nearly a heat map, now it's getting a bit technical there that this is where you're waiting somebody's contribution for each one of these, but it is something that I've seen. Okay, so it's not necessarily here, uh, always tick boxes, but I think tick boxes work for what I'm trying to kind of get across here. And what we can see if we took it, like, take a quick scan of this is contributor five has done the lease. Now I'm saying the lease that taken at a face value funding acquisition that could have been weeks of work. Like we don't know that. I mean, and obviously there needs to be that background uh, back story as well. But we're just taking this at face value optics. There are five ticks per contributor five. Okay. So what where would that go? As a suggestion, what that could mean then is you're having this discussion with your research team, and what you could say, well, if you look at our taxonomy here, 
contributor files, wherever it is, has done there, actually the least work here, it's only a couple of small bits, it's been very beneficial. What we should be doing here is contributor one to four would be authors, contributor five will be acknowledged. That's an example. Now I'm not saying that this is the way it has to be done or anything, but I suppose this is an example of how you can actually use tack the credit uh, to actually have this discussion around authorship and contributions. And then something that I'd see sometimes in some papers as well is you'd see something around an author's contribution statement. So this was mentioned in one of the previous dilemmas about the, the, the editor saying, look, that they weren't happy with the con uh, author's contribution statement. So this is kind of giving you an example of how you how you could see one. Again, this is just one example. There are many ways of doing this. But just say you produced work, John Doe and Marge Simpson produced work. So these are the two authors for um, a, a particular body of work. In their author's contribu author contribution statement, they could do something like this, where their, their initials would go in brackets after each one of, I suppose, those aspects to the taxonomy. Like that would be an author's contribution statement. Okay, then now that's one example of how to use. Like there's other ones, like if you Google there, how to use author contribution statement, you'll get different examples. But this is one that, I mean, it's quite straightforward. You're mentioning the taxonomy, you're, you're referencing it, and then you're calling out the various components here. And just, I, I did it for on purpose here. In this one here, like I've done 13 of the 14. I didn't call out funding. I'm just kind of saying, oh, maybe there was no funding here. So that's why it's not mentioned. And that could be the case. So it's not that all 14 have to be mentioned. Maybe only 10 are applicable to your research study. So you just mentioned those 10. Okay, so it's just kind of, there is that obviously flexibility. Uh, so it's not something that's set in stone, okay? And we're doing okay here in time. Just one last thing, because it just mentions, uh, it touches on contribution is you're encouraged, and it's called out in our ownership policy, to have an ORCID. An ORCID is an open research and contributor ID. And this is where all your research outputs, both peer reviewed, and maybe something that, maybe some outreach initiatives that you might have, if you can attach an ORCID to it, can all be compiled together as in your ORCID, so you can have an ORCID profile. So it's just something to be aware of. Also then, the National Research Integrity Forum is, uh, I've mentioned that a good few times in today, this session here, I, what I reference is the National Policy Ensuring Research Integrity in Ireland. But in March 22, they actually came up with a framework to enhance research integrity in research collaborations. It's quite a nice document, quite well put together. Uh, it, it, it's an easy read. Essentially, it's how I look at it. And it, it gives guidance for researchers on how to re reinforce a culture of research integrity in their collaborations. Because I suppose in, as, a, as a technological university, we do collaborate. We collaborate a lot both internally as in, in the university, but also externally. And it's important that when we do these collaborations that there's a certain awareness around that kind of culture of research integrity. And what we recognize as, is that that understanding of the principles of research integrity and what is what are we going to be doing in, in relation to various aspects of the collaborative uh, process that we're in. Okay, so this, uh, framework can be quite helpful to avoid instances of research misconduct or QRPs or questionable research practice, practices during the collaborative work. And often these can be simply down to having discussions at the very start. Look, this is how we're going to be doing this work. Having that and that, let that be an agreement among all the partners. This is how we're carrying out the work. And then if somebody comes later on and kind of wants to do something else, you'll say, well, that's kind of in conflict with what we said that we do at the start. That doesn't mean it can't be done, but there has to be at least awareness that that deviates off from what we'd said we did. Okay. Okay. So I have, look, I, I have one more dilemma. I was kind of play, leaving it. Uh, so I said I'd see with time. But what I'm going to just do here is see, look, does anyone have any questions? I can put up another dilemma, maybe just to see if people want. No, it's not that I'm looking to, I mean, it's nice, obviously, to finish early as well. But, um, Will I go through uh, one more dilemma? I think they're I think I think they're useful. I don't see anyone jump uh, well saying no anyway. So let's let's go with one more dilemma and then we leave it there. Okay. So the last dilemma, so this is dilemma three that we have, is you were a final year PhD student. So again, this is something that we, we created in Cirrus. Uh, you're about to submit an article to a peer-reviewed journal based on research that you have been doing for 18 months. You have largely been under the guidance of postdoc researchers as well as your PhD supervisors. Your head of function, who oversees a large number of projects, has not been involved in your research beyond occasional check-ins. Before you submit your article, the head of function emails to tell you to list them as an order on the paper. You do not think that this is appropriate. You are unsure how to proceed. You ask your fellow authors, so your postdoc researchers and your PhD supervisors, what do they think? 
And they say, say that you should include your head of functions name as an author on the paper. Okay. So this is completely fictitious now. Now, again, just to make that very clear, okay? Uh, well, I think it, it seems kind of it's, it's, uh, an interesting dilemma. So you, you're a final PhD student. You're looking at disseminating or publishing some of your work. You've been mainly supervised by postdoc researchers and PhD, uh, and you have your own PhD supervisors. When it comes to publishing some of your work, they, those co-authors are going to be mentioned, those, I suppose, contributors are going to be mentioned as co-authors, but your head of function then says that they want to be also be named. You, you're conflicted what to do here. Uh, so you reach out to your kind of, I suppose, line, I suppose your next, I suppose people that give you guidance, your postdoc researchers and the PhD supervisors, and they're saying it's okay, All right? Do go ahead with it. What do you do, okay? So let's see with this one, what are the options here? So you list the head of function as an author on the paper. You are nearly finished your PhD and would like a good reference for future opportunities. Despite what your co so that's A. B, despite what your co have advised you, you reach out to your research integrity and compliance officer for further guidance. I say our equivalent because I suppose to make this as broad as possible, but for far, you reach out for further guidance. You ask to speak to the head of function and explain why you don't feel the request is appropriate. You submit the article without the head of function's name on it. They are likely to, they are, they are not, they are likely, sorry, not to find out or other, okay? So quick recap, You've, uh, you're nearing the end of your PhD. You're going to look at publishing some work. The postdoc and PhD supervisors that have, have helped you are going to be named as, your, uh, as co-authors. A head of function that has only done reg irregular check-ins is asked to be named as a co-author. What do you do? Your, your conflict is you reach out to your uh, postdoc researchers and your PhD supervisor. They say, no, this is okay. Continue. What do you do? A, list the head of function as an author. You're nearly finished your PhD and it should help. B, despite the, uh, your co-author's advice, you go to the RICO or, or equivalent for further guidance. You ask to speak to the head of function as C and explain why you don't feel the request is appropriate. D, you submit the article without the head of function's name on it. They are not likely to find out. Okay, so let's see. I launched this. And um, here. So that other one might have been sharing the whole time. Hopefully you just closed it down now because I actually forgot to actually stop sharing it, but hopefully you figured that out. And here, this is dilemma three. What do you think for this one? So we have nine people left here. One person just uh, said they had to step out. So we have nine here. We have seven replies. They were fairly quick replies that we have here. We're doing okay on time. Okay. Okay, so what I'll do, that's fine. Seven replies there, and five. Four, eight replies, three, two, one. Okay, we'll stop there and I'll share it. So this is what we have, okay? So what we're seeing here is we're saying out of the people that have replied here, B and C are the two options here, where B is uh, that you go to the to RICO for further guidance and C is you go to the head of function and you explain your, uh, your position, okay? Now, it's an interesting one. The one thing that I find with B and C here, what they have in common is that you're opening up a dialogue, okay, where you're concerned. Like I wouldn't, I, I now maybe this is my own interpretation of it. And again, this is where there's that whole discussion piece with it, okay? So um, is you could look at, actually, I just, sorry, I closed down the poll. I don't know, did I stop sharing it or what? Yeah, stop sharing, just if it's coming up on your screen. So would be there, despite what your co-authors have advised, you reach out to your research integrity and compliance officer for further guidance. Now, for me, the big take wording for that, me being the RICO even, is its guidance. And like when I look at, I suppose, my particular role, like my role is around research integrity, which is promoting good practice. So it doesn't mean that if somebody goes to a RICO, or so it's a RICO in this university, if, you, if you're in, in another university, they're often called RIOs, research integrity officers. Just because you reach out to the RICO, doesn't necessarily mean that it's actually going straight. It's kind of like a nuclear option or anything like that. You're going to RICO for guidance. So I think B is an interesting option. But then C is also interesting because what you're doing here is you're asking, you're going to the head of function and explaining your situation, which is where you're opening up a dialogue. Now, it really depends on the situation. As you're at a final year PhD student, are you actually comfortable going to the head of function? Maybe you'd find that a small bit intimidating. I'd imagine if you went to the RICO, the RICO may ask, did you speak to the head of function? So maybe going to the head of function 
could be a first step before going to the RICO after you've obviously talked to your other co-authors. But that can vary, or that can be a tricky situation because you might just not be comfortable going to the head of function because that, to a certain extent, is where who you have the dilemma with. But I suppose what I would see with B and C is you're opening up a dialogue to try to see, look, how do you actually resolve this? Okay, so I can see merit for both of those. And really what it might take is I, you nearly need more information on who the person is, who are the researchers, what is the context, maybe kind of say to kind of go over one B or C. But in my mind, B and C would be our, our options there to this one. Uh, I wouldn't go with A. OK, because that's not in compliance with our authorship policy, just so I suppose just to see my, where my head is, will be at with this. And D, submit the article about the head of functions. I wouldn't go with that either, because in a way you'd say, is that nearly being kind of to a certain element dishonest because you've been asked to do it? Now you've been asked to do something that you're not comfortable with. But like, I mean, should it be a case of confronting that uh, as opposed to kind of ignoring it and hoping it would never come back at you? OK, so I suppose I wouldn't be encouraging D there either in that case. OK. Um, look, that's that's me done for this one. Um, perfect. I see there's a few uh, people leaving, signing off there. Actually, just one last slide, just so you know, because this will be in the slide deck. It's just the link to the Dilemma game. Now, the first Dilemma that I shared there did come from the Dilemma game. The other ones didn't. They were created by the Sira team. But it's just kind of, it's a kind of a nice idea to how you may handle certain dilemmas. Uh, and often it can be about having a, a conversation. I can see one hand up there. Do you want to go first? Oh, thanks, John. Um, oh, thank you very much for the presentation. I just no, I just want to try. It's not a question, really. It's more if anybody wants to do the game. It's it's a it's such a great game. It's it has won the uh, Euro, uh, Council of Europe award and everything. And the Netherlands are are using it as standard practice for their research. Um, you know, research and anybody doing PhD and master is very actually easy to use in the class. And as you say, not only does it have an app, but it also has a, a card a game option which you can do and it, it, it doesn't even necessarily have a right and a wrong answer, but it has, it, it requires a dialogue. So you can have two wrong answer, right answers or three kind of debatable answers. So it's around the debate. So, you know, I, I think it's a great thing to use with the students. So I, I, I have a, give it a go if anybody's teaching students that have an element of research in it. Perfect. Thanks very much for that. Because, and the other thing, just to add to that, what I find quite useful with the Dilemma Game app is that when you submit your answer, it actually then gives you the, how other people have answered uh, to this. And it will also then kind of, so for some of them, no, not all of them, it will give you an expert opinion. So after you've submitted your answer, you can kind of see the collective of how other users, what answers they've given. I, there's no mention of how many they are, but it gives kind of a general percentage. And then it will give you an expert opinion as well, which is quite useful to kind of to read through that as well. And you can submit your own dilemma as well. And there's a new one every month. Brilliant. Thanks very much for sharing that letter. That's actually, I didn't know about that with the new dilemma uh, share, um, uploading your own one. That's very interesting. So the slide deck of this will be shared afterwards and there's a link to it. I mean, if you Google it, you'll find it anyway, but um, it, it'll be there. It's, I find it very useful and hopefully you found it useful in, in this session here as well. So obviously, yeah, we're doing okay for time for finishing at two o'clock. Um, so if there's no questions, I'm happy to, to leave it there. Okay, look, thank, thanks, thank you for the, the feedback there on the chat. That's brilliant. And as mentioned there, uh, Lydia just popped it into the chat there that this the recording here will uh, be up in our YouTube video. And there's other uh, record recordings from various other sessions that we've had uh, up there as well that you might want to check out. Okay, I think we leave it there. So thanks very much, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. All the best. <laughs>